Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. I'm Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and I'm joined today by Jamal Young from Texas A&M. Dr. Young is an associate professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Culture. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. I've invited Dr. Young on to talk about his new article in the journal Investigations in Mathematics Learning, and the article is titled Mathematics Dispositions and the Mathematics Learning Outcomes of Black Students. How are they related? But first, Dr. Young, let's get a little bit of background. I'm just curious where you did your graduate studies and also maybe what was the focus of your dissertation research? So I did my graduate studies actually right here at Texas A&M University. And at that time, the focus of my dissertation research was actually technological pedagogical content knowledge. So I was actually really into technology migration uh, within graduate school. I think that was a lot driven by what was going on at the time. Uh, but this type of research that I'm currently doing has always been some, one of my uh, kind of passions as well. So I definitely, definitely am excited to get back into uh, this line of inquiry. Mm-hmm. And who were some of your mentors or advisor back in, in graduate school? My uh, dissertation advisor was Dr. Robert Caprero. Uh, also had uh, Dr. Chance Lewis, who's actually an urban ed scholar. So that's where a lot of the social justice equity focus uh, within my work comes from a lot of the work that I've done uh, with Dr. Chance Lewis. Um, I also worked with uh, Dr. Bruce Thompson within the stats fields. I have a lot of, you know, an RMS certificate was under his uh, his advisement. And uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Carpenter, uh, who's actually an art ed, but he did had a technology focus. So he was the one that kind of, you know, kind of rounded out my committee, so to speak. Yeah, and uh, a lot of collaborations. And that's kind of a theme of this article, too, because the article in Investigations in Mathematics Learning you're here representing a, a team of six co-authors. Right, um, there's C- right, Cunningham, right. Ortiz, Frank, Hamilton, Mitchell. Um, so how did this author team come together for the IML article? And then what was the main purpose that your group had for this study? Um, so initially, um, I was working with one of my graduate students who is Hamilton, uh, Christina Hamilton. Uh, I was working with her initially on the piece, and we realized uh, that we really needed to bring in uh, some folks that had a deeper understanding of critical race theory. But we knew that that, wanted, that was going to be the, the driving uh, theoretical framework for this piece. But neither one of us had, you know, a really, really deep background in that. And so what happened was I was working initially with Dr. Ortiz. Uh, he also graduated from Texas University. And I met him through my mentor. So he was actually working with Dr. Robert Caprero when I was at the University of North Texas. And I was like, you know, Doc, I really need you know, some graduate students uh, that kind of have this certain sort of equity focus. I don't really have any here at UNT at the time. And um he kind of connected me with uh, Dr. Ortiz. And then after he graduated, uh, he's now at uh, Georgia State, we actually continued our relationship. So he was the first one that we brought into the project. Once he came in, he was uh, like, you know what? I really think uh, Dr. Frank would be a great addition to the project. And then she actually came aboard. And then finally, I'm also a member of an online uh, mentoring group uh, called Race Mentoring within Facebook. And Dr. Cunningham will recently uh, graduated Dr. Cunningham. She's actually a graduate student at the time with this piece. And um, she reached out to me and said, you know, do you have any projects that are, that are you know, interested in critical race theory? And so it all just kind of happened almost organically. Uh, and we finally, we met Dr. Mitchell uh, at the RCML conference. So it was really, really interesting that we got this piece in IML because uh, RCML is the kind of conference for this organization. So it was a really, really cool collaborative piece to actually have, you know, done with all these different organic relationships just kind of came about just through our our shared networks. Yeah, that's great to hear everybody coming together. And so what was the the driving purpose that kind of, you know, was in front of you all that you could all coalesce around? Well, I think, you know, initially what we were trying to accomplish was to add a quantitative lens to the growing body of research on Black student mathematics identity. Uh, there's a lot of qualitative research out there. Um, we really wanted to, to add that quantitative piece to that growing body of literature. We felt like, you know, with this quantitative piece that we would be able to add, uh, the field would have a more complete picture of what that looks like. And we talk a lot about, you know, what this looks like qualitatively as math education scholars for, for this particular population of, you know, Black students in particular, but there wasn't really anything that looked at it from a quantitative lens. So we really wanted to infuse that into what we were doing. So that was really the driving force uh, of this piece. Yeah, and it was great that you could use the high school longitudinal database, like that large data set, to be able to ask some of your questions. And in the article, you you look at Black students' dispositions 
um, around mathematics and identity and things. And then you also look at black students learning outcomes and you specifically kind of focus on GPA and their credit accumulation. And in the article, one thing that really struck me was, you know, this team, your group, you made a strong case against always using white students as a basis of comparison. Like here's the white students and now we're going to look at other subgroups, you know, compared to white students. And you argued against that framing around always comparing to white students. And you also decided not really to use a standardized test score. You wanted to use GPA and credits that they accumulated in mathematics. I wonder if you could just sort of, you know, summarize the arguments that your team made around those two points. Oh, well, I think when we talk about using white students as a reference, um, a lot of that really stemmed from the critical race theory focus of the piece. And so, you know, if you're not really familiar with critical race theory, one of the, the big overarching ideas is that racism is everywhere and it's pretty much embedded in all that we do. And so when we think about using white students as a comparative group, um, there's been a lot of research by notable scholars like uh, Dr. Uh, Rochelle Gutierrez, who's talked about, you know, that really, in some respects, perpetuates white supremacy. Uh, by using that student, that student group as your reference group and always kind of thinking that every other group needs to meet that particular group's uh, achievement standards. So that was one of the things we wanted to um, kind of push back on a little bit. And, you know, as I've done a little bit of research with Nate Data in particular, one of the things that really gets lost in constantly comparing every other group to white students is that we never really see how white students individually are doing. And so that's one of the things that's very, very interesting in some of the, the work that I'm doing right now is looking at in groups independently. Over the years of administrations of, uh, of the NAEP, white students really haven't increased in their progression as far as achievement, but no one's talking about it because they're always the reference group. So that's one of the things that also gets lost when we're always using them as a group that we're comparing everyone else to. We really don't focus on their mathematics needs, their mathematics achievement uh, as an individual group. Uh, as it relates to standardized tests, we really were, were drawing again on some of the work for Dr. Rochelle Gutierrez when she talks about, you know, gap gazing in particular and how, you know, standardized tests really only give us a snapshot of uh, that one point in time in which the students sat down and took that test. And we really wanted to make sure that from this piece, uh, we made a very, very strong impact on a bigger, more practical outcome measures. So like your GPA, and the credits earned because those things are directly related to your ability to enter STEM fields. So your GPA is gonna help you get into college. The credits earned will also help you uh, getting into college. So we're thinking about those things as uh, just better predictors for what we were looking at and thinking about disposition and how those ideas are really related to persistence and you know resilience, so to speak. And so using these more uh, comprehensive measures uh, we felt like that was those were better indicators for what we were looking at uh, in this particular uh, piece. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is really good kind of bringing in some quantitative data. In this article, you look at black students uh, on their own, you know, as we're going to mm -hmm. try to understand the relationships within this group and not to compare it to other groups. And then for the disposition side, so the black students' dispositions, you looked at identity, utility, self-efficacy, and interest, and then you found some mm -hmm. you know, positive findings around identity, self-efficacy, and interest. How should the listeners think about those variables of identity, utility, self-efficacy, and interest in the context of this study? So um, we utilized um, how the high school longitudinal study measured and operationalized these constructs. And so thinking about them, we think about uh, mathematics identity. Um, I always like to say you know, within this particular context, we're, we're looking at it from the standpoint of the students seeing themselves as a math person. So whenever we think about identity, we're thinking about, okay, does this student feel that they could be a math person? Do other people see them uh, as, as a math person? That's actually a couple of the items, how they're worded on a particular uh, scale. Uh, we think about interest. You know, that's something that they're, they're particularly interested in. And this particular measurement is not looking at career interest. Is more or less just their general interest in mathematics. Um, and then self-efficacy, I mean, we all in education, you know, there's a long, long history related to the importance of self-efficacy. Um, and so thinking about mathematics self-efficacy, it wasn't really surprising that that actually uh, was a positive indicator um, as well. Together, those were the three primary factors that had an influence on their uh, GPA as well as the number of credits earned. What was interesting was that um, when you look at the actual descriptive statistics for these measures, 
uh, utility had the highest mean score across the group. So essentially, all of the students really felt that, you know, there was a lot of utility uh, within mathematics. However, um, it just really wasn't a strong predictor of their GPAs and their credits earned. So we thought that was, you know, one of those findings that, you know, kind of gets lost in the paper, but it's also something that we found that was very, very interesting that that was the highest uh, mean score the students had. I'm making a connection because in my last interview, I was talking to Michael Weiss about secondary mathematics in general, and he was saying that it seems like our curriculum and our focus is really on trying to, to convince people of the utility of mathematics. We really try to hammer that this is useful. You need this stuff. Uh, And Michael was saying, like, we really maybe need to actually make it more interesting, just make it more engaging. And like, and now that's kind of what I'm hearing you say, too, is like, yeah, people, people sort of admit that it has some utility, um, but the interest level is not always very high for everybody. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a a very, I would definitely agree with that. I think, you know, we, we, because students do ask about it a lot, you know, I think we spend a lot of time trying to drive that idea home and I think we've done a good job and this data kind of indicates within this particular population of students that we have done a pretty good job of that but you're right looking at the the interest piece of it is something that we may want to shift uh, some attention to. Mm -hmm. So in your analysis you used a canonical correlation analysis and so I'm just wondering if kind of from the top level view if you could give us a summary of what you found when you looked at those disposition variables and then you looked at the GPA and the credits. So in our uh, canonical correlation analysis, what we did was we created two variants. The first one uh, was a variant that was comprised of those four constructs, the mathematics identity, mathematics interest, self-efficacy, and utility. Essentially, we want to see those combined variables, what was their combined influence on the combined variable variant of GPA and credits earned. And so we found a statistically significant correlation between those two groups of variables. After further analysis, uh, we found that the individual contributions uh, were strongest for mathematical identity. So that had the the strongest contribution to the model, followed by interest and then uh, self-efficacy. And so those were the ones that we really kind of keyed in on in our discussion part of the article was kind of thinking about how can we unpack these things and think about, you know, why are these things the most important factors? And then what can we do as mathematics educators to help support students uh, in these particular areas. Yeah, and so you you did see what you were kind of hoping to, to see in terms of providing some quantitative evidence that also backs up the sort of importance of identity and with this group of Black students in particular. Um, so I wonder now, like, what do you see as some changes or efforts that you would want to see from math education, like as a field, with regard to Black students' experiences or their dispositions? Now that we've sort of seen from a lot of different angles, we've seen how the dispositions are important and the identity development is important. What, what would you hope to see as some efforts or some changes in math ed? Well, I think one area where um, we can definitely take this information and use it is in some of the research that we're currently doing about the productive struggle. Thinking about how we can utilize the idea of the productive struggle to build mathematics identity, to build mathematics self-efficacy, and to build mathematics entry. So kind of thinking about what you were talking about with engagement, um, that idea of the productive struggle, I feel like, is directly linked to these ideas. So, you know, if students kind of struggle through mathematics and then they find success, they start to think, you know what, I, I, I am a math person. You know, if it's an engaging activity that kind of makes them think and ponder and question and go back, that helps to build, you know, their interest in the mathematics. And then once they see that success from actually going through this difficult task with actually seeing success after completing it, that, that builds their self-efficacy. So I think you know, one of the key elements that we as mathematics educators have to do a better job of is how do we, you know, really and truly uh, dig into this idea of the productive struggle and utilize it to help build uh, student identity, self-efficacy, and uh, interest. Now, the, the, the counter to that is, I feel a lot of times in our mathematics education classes, we have what, what I we talk about in the article as the destructive struggle. So unfortunately, <laughs> students struggle, 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 and they never see success. And so really and truly making sure that students have successful mathematics outcomes, especially in environments like the classroom, where teachers have a little bit more autonomy to control that environment. 
I think is key to building a positive mathematics identity, a positive self-efficacy, and a, a, an increasing interest in mathematics. Yeah, that's definitely something to think about. And I, I like the connections you're making to a conversation that people are having about productive struggle, but then you're, you're really bringing this lens of specifically with black students and how their, you know, identity development is important. And we know that just from, you know, studying them directly. You also in the paper talk about curricular choices and how it is, it is kind of a white institutional space and the curriculum has been historically kind of dominated by white people and white, you know, groups. I wonder if you could just share a little bit of, of what you were saying there, too, about how we might need to think about curriculum in relation to the interest and the identity development of the black students. Yeah, I definitely you know, think that that's one of the things uh, as we were working on this piece and kind of sitting down and, and unpacking this, we realized that we have to talk about the curriculum because it all really kind of starts uh, and ends there. Um, if we don't have curriculum that reflects uh, the interest and reflects the just general ways of being of, of black students, a lot of times it's not going to be engaging. You know, it's not going to be something that they can see themselves engaged in if they don't have, you know, representation within the curriculum. And that's just not saying just, you know, putting black and brown faces in the curriculum, but actually thinking about it in, at a more deeper level as to how do we infuse or create a curriculum that resonates with their ideas, with things that they experience, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis with their interests uh, and so forth. I think that's that's a very, very uh, complex task. I mean, I think it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to do just as education in general. Um, and I think that is, you know, why a lot of times we, we start to have a lot of conversations about uh, representation within a uh, teaching population and creating, you know, parity between uh, students' ethnicity and teacher ethnicity. That piece of it a lot of times gets lost in more of the policy things that are looking more towards um, you know, meeting certain standards and meeting certain quotas is that idea that if you have teachers with similar backgrounds and students, they can kind of see, okay, this is something the students would be engaged in without buying into stereotypes. I think that's one of the things that we really, really struggle with uh, when we're creating a curriculum, um, trying to engage teachers, in particular pre service teachers, and creating these culturally responsive uh, educational activities is, you know, they're always trying to tote that line between uh, something that is, you know, engaging and then something that's really you know, perpetuating stereotypes. So mm -hmm. definitely, definitely, you know, a very, very difficult task. But I think as we increase, you know, the number of um, scholars of color and teachers of color and math, uh, math ed in particular, we can definitely uh, address some of the curricular challenges that we currently face. Mm -hmm. The article was just released in Investigations in Mathematics Learning. So I've been speaking with Jamal Young from Texas A&M. And uh, Jamal, I have one final question for you just to finish off the year here um, to have a little fun. But I wonder if you weren't in math education, what you might imagine as an alternative career for yourself. Well, that's funny um, because my actual undergraduate degree from Texas A&M is in biomedical engineering. Uh, so if I wasn't in math ed, I would probably see myself uh, working for someone like Nike or Under Armour, uh, developing athletic equipment. I think that would be where that was always kind of my goal. I think I spent a lot of my, my time, my first couple of years teaching, I was actually a football coach. And, oh, yeah. you know, that was, yeah, was always, you know, my initial reason why I went into biomedical engineering was actually look into uh, that as a career goal. So that's probably where I would be if I wasn't in uh, <laughs> math then. Yeah. You know, it's been an interesting year for sports, you know, with sports kind of coming and <laughs> yeah. going, a, a different format. How are you feeling about sports for 2021 or being there at Texas A&M? How are, how are things going there? Well, you know, we just got snubbed in the, uh, in the playoffs. So, you know, we're, we're a little bitter here, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but I think, you know, going into 2021, hopefully with the, uh, football in particular, uh, we'll come out with a little chip on our shoulder and get it done for next year. I think mm -hmm. that hopefully with, with all the things that are going on with COVID-19, uh, we'll get, get back to business as usual a little bit better. And I think that'll help, you know, everybody's spirits and, you know, everything. I think that's one of the things that unfortunately gets underestimated is the importance of sports, not just, you know, for the kids that are playing it, but, but for communities. It definitely yeah. helps to uplift communities and keep spirits up, you know, especially during trying times. Yeah. Mizzou, I know, got uh, paired up in the bowl game with Iowa, which I think you were at Iowa oh. before, right? Yes, yes, yes. You know, that, that, that'll be an interesting matchup. I'll be, I'll be rooting for Mizzou, but I think I might pick Iowa in that game. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but Yeah, awesome. It's been great talking to you and have a wonderful break. Yes, you too. Have a happy holiday.